Good morning, and welcome to this morning's study. And um, we're going to continue looking at Daniel chapter 11. And as usual, there's uh, things that I have to respond to, um, things that come up uh, in between studies. And so we will look at those things. But before we do, let, let's um, have a word of prayer. A dear Father in heaven, thank you. Uh, for the time here this morning to open your word. We are thankful, Lord, for um, the work of your spirit in ages past um, with Martin Luther nailing the 95 Theses on the church door in Wittenberg. And uh, we know, Lord, that a lot of truth has unfolded in the last 506 years. And we know, Lord, that we need your presence every day to teach us. And so we invite your spirit to be here. Help us to understand the things we study. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. And um, so on one of the comments on the video from yesterday, a guy, Armageddon 66, which I don't know who it is actually, but um, he has a, a comment which I don't fully understand because he seems to sort of tie lots of different things together that uh, I wouldn't consider. Um, you know, talking about Zionism and things like that, which I don't really think have any role in Bible prophecy, though. You know, he does bring up something here about uh, uh, the Americans recognizing Jerusalem as the capital on December 6th, 2017. That is, Trump did that. And then uh, moving the embassy to Jerusalem on, I think it was May 14th, 2018. Um, I've, I've never seen those placed in a line anywhere um, as some type of symbol but, uh, I mean, those might be things that we could place in a line. But he he seems to have the impression that somehow, because um, he says here, he says, I feel sorry for you that you insist on messing with the natural study of Daniel 11, since the pair of Chawutu and Kimberly had an innocent and pure guidance at the right time. Now, I'm not denying that what Chawutu did uh, was, um, you know, of God. So we know that God leads his people, and he definitely led in that um, unfolding of light, and Chao Tu was a part of that. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's definitely unfortunate what happened to them. I was very disappointed with how they were treated by Parminder and ultimately FFA. Um, I do think there is a fault that they made that is being hurt personally by what happened. You know, one of the things we have to recognize is that none of this should ever be considered personally. That is, there's a battle going on, and when people attack us, it's not us that's being attacked, it's God. And so we should trust that God can defend himself. And I know it's hard at times because, you know, we've all experienced it. Uh, but it shouldn't have chased them out of the movement. And it shouldn't have stopped them from participating in the discussions that went on. But, but those things do happen. Um, so I don't have anything against them. Uh, I do think Chao Tu made some errors in, and I understand the temptation that that would be, and that he brought this light, and he believed that maybe prophetically he was Samuel Snow. And but that expectation that FFA would then recognize this and he'd be elevated to some sort of status within the movement uh, was part of his downfall on a personal level. But I don't know personally, you know, all the things that go on. I mean, I only know what I have seen. But as far as the interpretation of what we have gone through in looking at Daniel chapter 11, we can see that no matter how much God was leading Chawa to, there's no way that he could have anticipated what was going to unfold since 2017 and place that in the lines 
So the fact that we're making this application now has to do with the history that we've passed through. Now, I know Stephen knows more about Chao Tu's interpretation of Daniel 11. I have never seen Chao Tu's presentations. Uh, Armageddon 6.6 gave us links to number four and five, which actually go past these parts that we have studied already. They start going around to the time of Raphia. So I don't know what he said about these earlier verses. Um, so, so, and we've already reviewed these. Now, Stephen, have you watched the videos? Do you have any comments about about that, about Chao Tu's in, uh, interpretation of Daniel 11 and where we're going wrong if what, what Armageddon 6.6 6 is talking about? Um, well, I, I sort of see what you're doing is kind of separate from what they did. Uh, Jeff had presented Chao Tu's observations in Holland uh, yeah. before actually before actually Chabatu actually presented it. And mm -hmm. um, I was at them presentations. Yeah. Um I think there's some things I maybe thought maybe were weak arguments within it, some things, but uh, I think that was something that generally the movement I accepted uh, at the time. Um, I haven't really seen anything to disregard it. Um, you know, the, the, okay. well, well, so part of it has to do with the United States and Russia. So we didn't see the United States and Russia as we expected to be in these conflicts. Now, you could argue maybe there is this proxy war going on in the Ukraine between the U.S. and Russia. Right. And uh, Russia has sort of connected itself with communist China with the BRICS situation there. So unless you can maybe sort of tie in some atheistic aspect there. But but I think we would have to say that Russia is not the king of the south. In in you know, since its fall, since the fall of the Soviet Union. Right, because that's sort of what it was contingent upon. It was contingent upon this idea. Well, it just only came up to the neck. The head survived. And so, you know, Russia is still the king of the south. Now, so that's why I'm getting confused with this, because the idea that it's moved to the UN, that's something that we really developed after July 18, 2020, and after basically uh, Trump. Uh, Trump lost to Biden. So, you know, I don't know if, you know, the idea then is that we would have to go back to the idea that Russia is still the king of the South, which, which I'd have a hard time doing because it doesn't have the characteristics of the king of the South. So, I mean, I don't know the details of Chao Tu studies other than I've seen Jeff's studies because yeah. in 2017, Jeff presented Rafi and Paneum. And I understood then how Jeff was looking at it and what they were looking for as far as war between Russia and the U.S. But I don't think we could look for that in that context. And that's maybe the United Nations has in some high going through Russia in some way cooperating with them to bring down the United States. Because with this year, these are wars are kind of draining United States resources. You know, they're just throwing money at uh, Ukraine. And um, there's potential for the, the collapse to occur. The, the One of the head bankers in the world is saying that we're on like a tipping point with the dollar. So unless there's some way. Yeah, I, I, there. I don't think that, I mean, I know what you're saying, but I don't think that's actually real. What what you're hearing. I don't think that, that that's the, that the current that the currency is not going to collapse. Yeah, that they're not throwing money at Ukraine. 
Yeah, well, I, I don't think that that's going to cause the collapse of the U.S. currency. Well, I'd say it would be an, an aspect of it. Now, we've already had money thrown during the, the pandemic. There's yeah, so much everybody, spent on the as well. Everybody threw money away at, during the pandemic. So unless you're talking about like the collapse of the world economy, I don't know. I just don't think that that's real news, what you're talking about. I think that's more. Well, this is what, this is like the head of the top, one of the top banks in the world is actually saying this, you know, so I'm not, you know, you, th you would think something like I would know something what's going on in the financial circles. Um, yeah, I don't know. There's a lot of things that people say in because I've, I've followed financial stuff since the 70s. So, you know, people in banks say all kinds of things for self-interest that have nothing to do with reality. But, you know, I'm not an expert in what's currently happening. So maybe but you're saying that russia is involved with the un to try to take down the american america and russia's connected with china well they yeah, have the, the the brics currency they're looking they're talking about this here brics currency they're looking to replace the petro dollar so yeah the, the dollar's been connected to to the oil and how it's been traded so a lot of countries are now looking to an alternative to that, and uh, they're looking to maybe come up with like a BRICS currency, which is gold backed, something more stable that other nations can use rather than the United States dollar, which is just really backed by the, the largest economy just because we're the biggest economy in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. I'm just saying I've heard things like this, you know, for 40 years, 50 years. Um, and, you know, maybe there's more something to substantial now than there was in the past, but, um, you know, because things do change. But I, I don't know. I, I don't know if you could say we're now going to put Russia as the king of the south in this case. I just don't think Russia is the king of the south, the characteristics of the king of the south. This is just what I'm saying. The characteristics of the king of the south, atheism, Russia doesn't have that. Right. You can say, well, they're, you know, connected to other countries that like China that are atheistic. But I would think that we have to say that it's the UN, that the characteristics of these three powers, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, UN has to be this power that is the dragon power. And in this case, it is also the, the king of the south in the context of applying Daniel chapter nine. Right. And especially when you look at how we're applying it to our lines, um, I think we would be kind of blurring it with the bigger line. Because the other thing that that comes up in this discussion um, with Armageddon 66 guy in Romania, I assume, um, is that um, that when we're looking at at Raffia, let's say, is January 6, 2021. That somehow, that, that's not the raffia on the big line. That's not midnight. Because we, we understand that we're approaching midnight. We're in lines that have characteristics of raffia. We put it as November 9th. It is January 6th, 2021. But that's still not the raffia on the bigger line. Right? So I think that we need, we need to recognize that that this is about the United States and globalism and the American response to what's happening in the world today. So that the response of the King of the North is going to be the Republicans taking control once again of the United States. That would be Panium, right? But we know that there is another Raffia and Panium on a bigger line, right? That's so, so yeah, to try to, I don't know. 
So when the, the communism Russia fell, you're saying that the uh, United Nations then became the king of the south. We had sort of seen that Gorbachev moved to the UN. I think that was sort of observed some level. Mm -hmm. um, right. But you, uh, United Nations has been around you know, since 1949. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, maybe as an emerging atheistic aspect. Um, right. And, and you took those. So what we're saying is that 9-11 is when, when the UN was strengthened. Right. So the you know, UN has been there, but there comes a point in which it becomes the king of the South. And that's going to happen between 1989 and 9-11, right? That's, that's the way that I understand in our studies that we've looked at this. So there's this transition from the USSR to the UN, and that happens over a period of time, and it becomes strengthened um, at 9-11. Okay, so but you don't specific, uh, specify any particular event in that time period that you can sort of say well, this is when that transitions occurred or anything like that. It's... Okay, so to look at things prophetically, um, so one of the things about taking a, uh, a way mark and marking it at a specific date, you know, for instance, we have the fall of Turkey is August 11th, um, 1840. But we know Turkey doesn't technically, as far as the world is concerned, fall until the 1920s. Right? So, yes. so, so in order to find a prophetic marker, one of the arguments that people will have is things like, well, the 1260 years, there's really only a few hundred years of persecution, you know, and how, and you're just arbitrarily taking 508 and 538 out of all these different events. Right? Now, but there are symbols that are attached to things. So we know that November 9th, 1989, we have as a symbol of the fall of the Soviet Union, right? Now, mm -hmm. there's events that occurred that lead to the fall of the Soviet Union. And some people would say, well, the Soviet Union didn't actually really fall until December 25th, 1991, right? You can see mm -hmm. the point there. So there's a period of time. But we always mark November 9th, 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall. And you could see that in 2017 when Trump is at that dedication of the new building at NATO, the NATO building, where it was, I can't remember. Where mm -hmm. yeah, Brussels. Brussels, okay. Um, and, and then he, it's between these two symbols, 11-9 and 9-11, right? Mm-hmm. Dirt is from the, the Twin Towers and a piece of the Berlin Wall, right? Those are definitely prophetic waymarks. And it's between those two waymarks that that transition occurs. Now, we're saying that 9-11, because what happens with the events of the Patriot Act, which returns us to Roman law and removes common law so that you're guilty until proven innocent, and also what happens worldwide as far as um, that uh, the, the taking away of American freedoms, but also many freedoms around the world in this fight against terrorism. And we can see that the UN is definitely strengthened in that, in what happens. So um, the cooperation between the United States and the UN as far as that war on terror is concerned. Um, you know, people could say, well, the UN's always there and the UN's got different relationships going on with the United States. So why take 9-11? Well, because it is a waymark, right? So we would have to have a waymark in our lines that is going to be used to, to symbolize that. And so 9-11 symbolizes that. So, so now you have the King of the South established. It's definitely no longer the Soviet Union by 9-11 and, and the UN is now taking on that role. And we see that continual breakdown of the rights that are in the constitution, because that's what we're taking this fortress to represent in Daniel 11 
is to represent the Constitution. And so, what, so yeah, go on. So how would you then apply that, the idea that the comes up to the fortress, to the neck? Uh, would you say then that the head then would be, after that, United Nations? Yeah. So that yeah. So the head is 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 this is spiritualism. It's that aspect: atheism, spiritualism, licentiousness, Sodom, and Egypt. Right. Egypt primarily is the king of the south symbol, but but we can see that there. So that's the the head is. You know, you could say it's communism, whatever kind of word or label you wanted to place to it, but that no longer is part of the Soviet Union. In, in the strictest sense, because it's now a Christian country. You know, it's Russian Orthodox, but it's still Christian. It's not atheistic. But the UN is, and its reach globalism is, is, is now moved from the communism of the Soviet Union that was really a globalistic idea. Now it's moved to the UN. So the UN is really socialist or communist. Um, in its overall goals and aims, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the way that I would would understand this. And when we deal with we dealt with um, uh, some of these verses, so we were looking through uh, these verses here. Um, so when they made an agreement, they shall not retain the power of his arm, neither shall his arm stand. Where is this? Um, Trying to find this verse. Um, all right, so they're going to make this agreement, and where it is. Okay, um, trying to remember. My, my mind's going blank. Okay, so. Okay, so Angela has some comments there, which right now um, we won't look at. Just can't find, I can't think of the word that I'm looking for here that we examined. Okay, so we have this agreement. So this is it, yeah. Verse six, and at the end of years shall they join themselves together for the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. Now, what we have here is the king of the south, and it's at the end of years. So we have to try to figure out what is this talking about? And then uh, the king's daughter of the south. So this is a daughter, a woman, represents a church of the south. So this is this atheistic philosophy uh, comes to the king of the north to make an agreement. That make an agreement means, uh, I mean, we could translate this as um, uh, promote um, rights, right? So an agreement is the word, of, the word it com comes from a word that means evenness, that is figuratively prosperity or concord. Also, straightness, that is, rectitude, uh, agreement, uh, rights, that rights that are equal, equity, or right. So I first fought against this idea because we know that there's a league that's going on. But this league is centered around uh, uh, these counterfeit rights, these human rights. And so we can see that that is something that happens uh, progressively since 9-11. So, so that's where we, we took that this is about uh, what we see happening worldwide in the area of what we call wokeism. So, so that's part of this globalist agenda. And, you know, when we, when we look at what's happening, this is a destabilization of society. And, and I think that's the destabilization that is, um, is the most powerful, even from an economic point of view. Um, 
is if you have uh, people who are completely immoral, they can't stand. I mean, this is what happened. They tried to curse Israel, you know, Balak using Balaam, right? Trying to curse Israel. But the only thing they could do was to bring in this licentiousness, right? And that, of course, would cause uh, what, what, you know, Balaam was seeking by cursing them. And so, so I think, I know this is kind of rambling a bit, but the idea here is that we're taking our main waymarks and we're, we're seeing these waymarks represented in these lines. So, so I think we would have to say, you know, if we're going to be doing what we're doing and we, they seem to be that these numbers fit into these structures, I think we have to accept that this interpretation makes the most sense. Right. So. Yeah. So we have obviously this timeline of the UN. Um, so they ask a question, Angela, I guess, is asking a question about from this period. So we've got um, June 25th, uh, 45. So we've got these different dates. Uh, the UN time would include gathering of US, UK, but April 25th, 1945, June 25th, 45, and uh, October 24th, 45. And just asking if we could look at these spans and if they have any significance uh, prophetically, right, connecting to 9 11. Is that kind of what your question is? Yeah, I'm just trying to look at the only thing I, I focused on was, uh, 200, 2,941 weeks and six days. Cause I'm taking a box H2941, right? And then it says 5641.92%. I'm thinking, okay, well, H5641, what's that? But I mean, I could be off base, but I'm, I was looking at those three dates and wondering how they connect with 911 and whether there's any, any, you know, if you do with prophecy. In, in what we're going through right now. Okay. Um, now, I did make a connection between the UN at one time. I'm just trying to see if I can find this span of time. Um, so, yeah, October 24th, 1945, uh, the UN was ratified. Now, Charter. yeah. Now, I originally had connected this to um, uh, these dates. Um, okay, so I'll show you what I have here. Um, so you can look at my old chart. So I don't know when I made this chart. It was a while ago. Um, it was, you know, a couple of years ago. So this, this chart here is not made in the context of what we're discussing. So I have October 24th, 1945, the UN is ratified. And I count the number of days to June 22nd, 2022. Oh. And it's 28,000 days or 77.77777 prophetic years. So it connects to this June 22nd, 2022 date. So when I was looking at that, we were in, we might have been in 2022 or before 2022. You can see I put the 777 days from November 9th to December 25th. Um, the number of days from October 24th, 1945 to November 9th, 1989 is 16,087 days. That is a prime number. It's the 1,872nd prime number. Okay, makes sense? Mm -hmm. So we can see that symbol and that's, this 777 days then mirrors that, you know, those 30 years apart. And then I go to December 21st, 2012. That is going to be um, that Mayan calendar date. And it's 24,530 days, which is 817 prophetic months and 20 days. So it's got the, you know, 718 or July 18, if you go backwards. And 20 days gives you 2020. 
So that's what I had done with this at that time. Now we don't see September 11th in here, right? So, you know, maybe it should be, maybe we should look at that, but I haven't looked at it. But we can connect September 11th with November 9th, right, as a symbol. So we can see that November 9th date. And we've already connected um, actually through the April 30th or April 5th, 2030 date. We've connected November 9th and uh, 9-11, right? So we've, we've connected those way marks. So I, I would think this be, it would be a witness to it, this the ratification of the UN is connected to this history. Any comments by anyone on this? I'm really thankful for all the groundwork you've been doing. Certainly beyond me. <laughs> but, but anyway, you can just see that November 9th is directly connected to the ratification of the UN by... 16,087 days, which is 1872, that's the prime number, the 1,872nd prime number, which we have as a symbol of July 18, 2020. And, and here in this, of course, yeah. Now, when we go to this December 21st date, 2012, you can see the number of days from when the UN is ratified. That span of time is um, the same span of time from my birthday to April 5th, 2030. So from when I was born, April 5th. Wow. Right. So, and so these, and my birthday is connected to the December 21st, 2012 date too. Right. Um, so, so there's a lot of things in here. There's a lot of stuff, you know, we're not looking at. But I'm just saying that the UN being ratified, we can connect to our lines. So, because it answers your question in part. Uh, the question is, mm -hmm. you know, right? And it's a, so yeah, I don't, I don't think it's a coincidence that we have that date for the ratification of the UN. But, but as far as the UN having their role, that's going to develop over that whole period of time up to the present even, right? The UN is still ultimately going to be involved in the Sunday law. Amen. So, so I'm just saying that we, we should be able to connect these things together in that way. So I, I think it was a good question and, and it probably we could examine it a little bit more. But I think when it comes to trying to, um, you know, say, well, Chawatu had this view, we're not disparaging that. We're not saying that, you know, we just discount it totally. But we know that God keeps unfolding more and more light. And as we pass through that experience of November 9th and July 18th, December 25th, 2021, and as we've been moving through this history, these things become clearer. Now, we're still making an application of Daniel chapter 11 to the history of our movement, not as this is the ultimate or the final application of these verses, right? Because I still think when we get to Daniel 11, 11, that when this is talking about the Battle of Raphia, we have to see this on Jeff's line as the as the line as the waymark of midnight, right? And we haven't reached that waymark yet. We're approaching midnight, so we're looking at a, a zoom into. You know, if we're going to put this on a line, we're, we're looking at a zoom into this midnight waymark. But we don't know what date that is. We only have symbolic dates, December 25th, 2023, April 5th, 2030, things like that. We have symbolic dates in the future, which symbolize the Sunday law, symbolize midnight, symbolize dates on our line. You know, obviously the first day of the first month in 2030, we connect to 9-11, right? 
we can do that from Ezra chapter um, uh, 7 to 10, where we have these way marks from the first day of the first month in 457 to the first day of the first month in 456 B.C. And, and that we can take those months, day for a month, 354 days, and we can line them up as months, starting with 9-11 and going to April 5th, 2030. So we have these symbols, but we're not predicting when these things are going to happen. We're not, we don't have a date on our line that we can say, on such and such a date, we expect midnight to occur. We just know that we're in lines that are approaching midnight. And, and in some ways, this analogy may be lost on some people, uh, but it's like um, trying to reach your goal by cutting your distance in half. So you can keep cutting your distance in half, but do you ever reach your, the, your goal by cutting your distance in half? Not really, right? You approach it. It's like approaching an, an infinitesimal, right? That's kind of what we're experiencing. At some point, of course, we get to midnight, but we can only see the distance being cut in half. We can't see the actual distance. Does that make sense? And maybe that's uh, too abstract. That's uh, severely abstract. <laughs> okay, it doesn't make any sense. No, it, it can make sense, but it's severely abstract. Okay, yeah. Yeah, so anyway, just in more plain terms, we can see that we're approaching something, but we can't know exactly when we're going to get there. Maybe a more practical thing is, as you're driving towards a city, city, I mean, you can see that you're approaching a city, or even climbing a mountain, you can see that there is a peak that you're to reach, but you keep having false summits, right? There's just ways in which you think that you're getting closer to something, and you are, but you just don't know exactly when you're going to get there. And, and so God is leading us along step by step. But once we've passed midnight, we will know it, right? Because we will be fully entrenched in something where there is complete clarity and and that is we know what midnight is that there is a message that is going to go out to adventism we will see the work being taken into god's hands in a way that it is clear that he is working and and that work in a sense is taken out of our hands right now we're doing a work that god has asked us to do but we can't imagine that somehow this is the work. And that's part of the problem I have with the views where we're, we're looking at this Sunday law in the United States as this imminent thing. And yet the work has not been done. You know, we, we can't expect those events. It's like when the Millerites are expecting Jesus to come back October 22, 1844, but they've disregarded all the things that have to happen before the second coming, that they had been proclaiming that should happen before the second coming. And so we need to recognize that there is a path that God is leading us upon. And midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law are still ahead of us. Even if we're sort of in the, you know, the border of this midnight, we're still not there. We still haven't passed it. Maybe that's a better way of looking at it. We haven't passed midnight. And and we know but we're in the say we're in, What's that? Sorry, could we say we're in sunset then? I remember when the movement was talking about sunset. Can't recall why exactly what it meant, but <laughs> Okay, so yeah, sunset see the signs, but where are we? Yeah, so we are in sunset, right? We're in we're between the two evenings, we're in the twilight. Right? We're in that period of time. Sunset in Millerite history is April April 19th, 1844, because if midnight is July 21st and October 22nd is morning, right, then then obviously April 19th is, is sunset. 
And, and so sunset is 9-11 in our lives. So, so since 9-11, in a sense, we've been in sunset. So we're in that period between sunset and midnight. But we're experiencing in our lines all of these fractals, all of these wheels within wheels that include symbols like midnight and midnight cry and Sunday law that we have passed. But we're not going to imagine that those are the actual midnight, midnight cry and Sunday law that Jeff has on his line that he that we had by 2016. Because we kept thinking, are we we passed midnight? I, I think once we pass midnight, everyone will know, you know, who has studied this message. We will know where we are at because world events will be much different than they are now. So we're seeing we're th seeing things approaching something. Uh, but people want to have the Sunday law before we even get to midnight. Right? So, so we can't do that. So now when we start looking at Daniel chapter 11, so we spent quite a bit of time going over that. So we know Daniel chapter 11 is Raphael. And we concluded yesterday, at least tentatively, that chapter 11 verse 10 is symbolizing the Sunday law, it has the symbols of the Sunday law, right? So now when we get back to Daniel 11 verse 11, we're coming to Raphael. So we're coming to the symbol of midnight. We're going back and repeating a line. So the king of the south shall be moved with choler and shall come forth and fight with him, even with the king of the north, and shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. So this event we have as June 22nd, 2017. Or not 27, 20, uh, 217 BC, right? If we take the 62 weeks and cut them in half, it's two periods of 217 years. And uh, the center of those 62 weeks is 191 BC. 191 BC is a symbol that we would attach, that, that Dwight presented at the camp meeting at Telford Muse, that relates to both 9-11 and 11-9, right? It's going to be when, when uh, Rome, it's the Battle of Thermopylae, and what's the significance of the Battle of Thermopylae? It defeats Greece, right? So Rome defeats Greece. And why is that significant if we're looking at these lines? Because it's the point where Rome is addressing its dominance onto the world stage. Okay, yeah, so... So that's what happens in 191. Now that we know that there's still going to be, as far as uh, William Miller looks at the division of these kingdoms, he's not going to mark 191 as where we pass from Rome to Greece, because he's going to look at it as these kingdoms have their contact with God's people, right? So he's going to go by this, basically the utilization of this, a uh, league between the Jews and the Romans as being implemented in 158 BC as the transition between these kingdoms, right? So that's where he's going to place it. Now, through time, because of that league with the Romans, it's, it's eventually going to lead to, uh, about 30 years later, the independence of Judea, from Greece and from Rome, it's going to be independent. And, and in a sense, when, when they make a league with Rome, the only reason they can do that is because they are developing that independence, that ability to make this league. Now, we have a period of 666 years that goes then to 508, an inclusive count. And if you go from the time of Judean independence, is either 129 or 128, depending on who you listen to. But that's still going to be 660 years 666 years to 5, 538. Yeah. Um, so Angela asks a question um, about between the two evenings, sunset, twilight. Um, couldn't uh, About the Passover lamb. It's killed between the two evenings from sunset to dark. 
Couldn't the final initial end time Sunday law be at least drafted by then during sunset twilight? Um, um, there are many state Sunday laws on the U.S. books, but the final end time one must be in the works. And it's, uh, I don't know what U slash K means, when exactly it will be passed. I don't understand that symbol. What's U slash K? Angela? It's unknown. I thought that was well known, but I guess UK is unknown. <laughs> okay, it's unknown exactly when it will be passed. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I don't use abbreviation. It's just, I, I just, I'm thinking of this, all these parallels. I know they all mean something. So are we going to see them reified? You know, <laughs> my fertile little brain is working today. No. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, there is some significance there when it relates to um, uh, Samuel Snow's letters in the Passover, because we know the first day of the first month there is between two different Passovers, the true and the false. It has to do with the division of the true and the false priests in our history. So, so there are some things about the Passover, but, but yeah. Um, so going back to this here, so we have, now I'd said that there is this number 23,111 and that I'd come to that number somehow um, by adding up some verse in some way. And I, I can't find it. So, so I'm not really sure why I, where I got that number from. <coughs> um, but I know it, it was based on something. So, uh, I know I added together some of these different verses and tried to find uh, how I got that number. But um, does it really make sense? So I'm going to have to figure that out again. I probably should have taken a note on what I had done with that. Um I didn't end up writing it out anywhere. So it's probably either a phrase or something else. But I remember I double checked it many times, whatever it was I was doing. But the idea is that 23,111 is 11 times 11 times 191. And it relates to these, these studies. So, so that we have this 191 and 1111 tied together with this number 23,111 that I have to recall how I came up with that number. So now we have the Battle of Raphia. We have this 1111 symbol. We have many ways in which we've connected it and understood it. And if we take um, that all of this other history preceding it is about our movement, you know, we have this option. We can go back and just say, well, we're going to take Dan this raffia symbol and place it, you know, as midnight somewhere in our lines. But I'm suggesting that this midnight is the actual midnight that is on Jeff's line from 2016. This midnight, midnight cry, Sunday law part. And that all of this other parts of our lines are just showing that we're approaching this symbol, right? Because it's using the symbol of 911 and 119. Those symbols are attached here, that we have this symbol of this Sunday law is overflowing, but it must be a type of the Sunday law because of how we're uh, applying it. We're applying it to our history, which is approaching the Sunday law. So if we look at Daniel 11, 11, then we're looking at something that's still future. That is, I'm not going to take this and now put it back into our lines. I'm going to say that this is still a future event. This is Raphia. The king of the south shall be moved with collar, shall come and forth and fight with him, even with the king of the north. And he shall set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given into his hand. 
So the king of the north is going to set forth a multitude. Now, what we're saying here is if we have this type of the Sunday law, I'm saying, it's just me saying it, and you have to decide whether you agree or not, is that we will see the Republicans defeat the Democrats. And in our line, that becomes very significant. But those, those are events that precede midnight. They precede raffia. So when it says here, the king of the south shall be moved with collar, we would have to look at a future event in which the king of the south is going to defeat the United States. This would not be something really internal within the United States like how we have looked at our lines presently. This would be a worldwide event. So this would be something of of much greater significance than what we have seen symbolically within our own lines. It'd be a lot different than just Trump losing to Biden and Biden becoming the president of the United States. That's true, and that's a, a, a type of the Sunday law. All those things have happened in the history. But we would still be looking for that event that we call Raphia, that is the real midnight. Any thoughts on that? I think I can agree that that this would be an external event. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be of much greater import than I think a lot of us have yet considered. Yeah. Yeah. You know, one of the things that I found interesting, so I'm having a discussion with a guy named uh, Doug Mason. And now Doug Mason, I mentioned him yesterday. So he became an Adventist in, in, 1963, and he left the Adventist Church in 82. He's he's definitely on the liberal side of things of Adventism. He was disappointed with what happened in Glacier View. Uh, that's one of the reasons he ended up leaving Adventism. And he doesn't believe that the book of Daniel is addressing the Messiah at all, right? He believes that these are sort of a type of a development of religion um, so that, you know, that we, we, he's sort of kind of a preterist in how he interprets Bible prophecy, but he still believes in, in an application in some ways to the present. So I, I have to read his book. He sent me his book. I've just skimmed through parts of it. But there is this view, um, you know, that because, you know, things people in, in, the, in the past saw things as applying to their time, but they didn't actually work out the way that they thought, that they were wrong. Right. Miller was wrong. You know, Jesus didn't come back. So we need to discount Miller. But we understand a principle that God continues to unfold to his people light, that the path of the just is as a shining light that shineth more and more into a perfect day. And that within God's word is hidden the whole history of the world. And that, you know, the gospel promise in Genesis chapter three, verse 15, even though Eve is going to think that the first child that's born to her is going to be, you know, and this is, of course, going to be Cain, going to be the promised Messiah, the one who would bruise the serpent's head. Um, it doesn't mean that she was wrong, right, in the sense of, I mean, obviously, Cain wasn't the promised seed, but she wasn't wrong in applying it to herself immediately. But that doesn't mean that we would say, well, you know, the promise was not about the Messiah. Right? That gospel promise is about Christ. When we look at all of the stories, we look at the story of Joseph. He's a type of Christ. It's not that we can just look back and say, well, there's some parallels between this Old Testament story and Jesus. And maybe what happened with Jesus was intentionally made to parallel the story of Joseph. We can see in the story of Joseph, the chronology of those events are, you know, the two periods of, of, and, uh, of 11 years, right, in the 22 years. And then the fact that you can take 
the, the 17 years and the 11 years, 17 times 11 is 187. I mean, there's just all of these structures that are in this story that relate to our lives presently today. And these can't be by chance. So God has designed in this story, whether the people at the time understood it or not, he has hidden in the story of the Bible, the whole history of the world. And he can speak to each generation who is going through the fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, He can reveal to them light from God's word for their feet. But at some point, We reach the culmination of these events of Bible prophecy, and they all come together, the effect of every vision. And that's what this movement is experiencing. So so we can't just look at what's happened in the past as we keep making mistakes. God is unfolding to us something. And when Jesus comes back, we will see it all in much much clearer terms, but we also need to see it. We need to see that path there as we approach the second coming of Christ. We don't need to know when that is going to be. We don't know the day or the hour, but we can't ignore how God is leading us as individuals, as a movement, as a church, as that great march of history leads to the purpose of history, that this, that what was promised in the Garden of Eden ultimately will be completed. And that the seed of the woman, which of course is Christ, but it is also his seed, right? The church at the end of the time, at the end of time, his bride, his glorious church, that he comes when Christ's character is perfectly reproduced in his people. He comes to claim them as his own. And we're working towards that. And if we just sort of ignore all that and just say, well, I don't know when Jesus is going to come back. I'm going to just live my life. We're never going to get there. We're never going to recognize Christ when he comes. So the question is, how do we then address this? So Daniel 11, 11, we can see these symbols. They go back all through the Bible ties us to the prophecies of the 70 weeks. It ties us to, you know, 9-11, 11-9. But it's pointing forward to something that is still to happen. And that is the world is going to have this aspect. This is the dragon power, the king of the south. It's going to come and fight with apostate Protestantism. The United States. So when it says he shall set set forth a great multitude, but the multitude shall be given in his into his hand, we can look at this historically. That's going to be the Seleucid Empire that that sets forth a great multitude. But the Ptolemaic Empire is going to be, defeat the Seleucid Empire in that battle of Raphia. Correct. Agreed. Now, it is interesting that uh, this battle of Raphia is, um, it's June 22nd, so we have that symbol of June 22nd. And the June 22nd shows up in, in Millerite history, right? And June 22nd is going to be, um, Samuel Snow's, uh, Third letter, that's his, uh, it's going to be Pentecost, his Pentecost letter. Um, But it also has the symbol of midnight, right? So you can connect Samuel Snow's Pentecost letter with with midnight, even though it's going to be before that. Now, we also have the Battle of Pidna. And the Battle of Pidna is also on June 22nd, but 49 years later. Is that significant? Okay, so Angela's saying uh, America is still under martial law because of the pandemic emergency. Haven't they stopped the pandemic yet? We're not under a pandemic anymore, are we? 
as far as I know, that act has not not been been been, been repealed, and Trump declared it on March thirteenth, twenty apparently. Okay. Okay. That and of course they all signed on, like Canada did too, signed on to who? So actually, on your international fake law, we're all under who's heel now, and there's a few people that are really active against it, and I'm reading their stuff and watching it, and I think this is act absolutely abominable and treasonous, and I don't intend to comply with any of it. But didn't they declare it's an absolutely end? Absolutely diabolical. But didn't they declare an end to the pandemic at some point? I mean, there is no oh, pandemic. Oh, there. Bill Gates just <laughs> announced a while back he plans a new one, and there's going to be another one, and there'll be another one, and they're inventing all of these modified RNA things, and it's, okay. well, I don't know. Let me start looking at the. Yeah, I don't know. I, don't... I think they've they've declared the end of the pandemic emergency. But I'm yeah. not too sure whether they've declared the end of the pandemic. So, well, if you um, the emergency, then that would be the end of the pandemic. It would. I mean, if there's no emergency, then then all those things are over. There never was. Yeah, but I but Except I but the fear you, porn. They declared a pandemic emergency. They declared an end to it. So that's the end of it. But, but uh, uh, anyway, um, let's just... If you watch what who's doing, it's not the end to it. They, they, they're they intensifying it. Decide. It's, it's immaterial right now. So to what we're talking about. So we have this June 22nd, 2017. Now, in, in both cases on the biblical calendar, they're going to be uh, the 12th day of the third month, right? So that's what I have listed there on the, uh, if, oh, I didn't show you the chart here. So let's look at this chart. Okay, so this chart has a bunch, a bunch of other things here that, that have uh, Samuel Snow's letters and, and so forth. But this is, it's this one here at the bottom. You can ignore this one on, on the right side, even though that's kind of important. Um, but here is this uh, 17,897 days. That's 49 years. And uh, you have the Battle of Raphia, June 22nd, 2017, and the Battle of Pydna, June 22nd, 168 BC. Now, uh, the Battle of Pydna, 168, um, uh, you know, it's, I, I don't know the significance of that battle. But I do know in the context of Raphia, what we have is a repeat of history. We have dates being repeated. And, and the fact that June 22nd is again going to be the 12th day of the third month in both of those years, that's kind of odd. You know, that's not very likely to happen. It doesn't always happen after a period of 49 years, for instance. Um, um, and then we have the Battle of Paneum in there, 200 BC, whenever it is. We don't have a date for the Battle of Paneum, but we do have for Pydna and Raphia. And, and why do we have dates for those battles? Does anybody know? Why can we nail them down in that way? Well, we have uh, 168 in the 1850 chart. Yeah, we do have it on the 1850 chart. And I was trying to see if I can't see my 1850 chart from here. Now, why did they put it on the 1850 chart? There's a room conquered the first division of Greece. Okay. So and is that what the Probably applying to Macedonia. Yeah. So is that what the Battle of Pydna is then? Is that what they're marking in 168? That's what I was wondering. Well, yeah, conquering the first division anyway, so I, I'm, I'm assuming that's Macedonia. I'm not sure. Okay. Now, um, so so why are why do we know these dates? That's the question I'm asking. Okay. 
if we're looking at this with the Battle of Pydna, yeah, we're dealing where Rome and 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 technically Macedon during the Third Macedonian War came to battle. Now this mm-hmm. marked the end of the Antigonid line of kings that stretched mm-hmm. back to Alexander the Great. Right. So would we be looking at this given you know what what you're showing here with Raphia, Pinium, and then Pydna, that Raphia and Pinia, because these are battles that took place between the Seleucid Empire and Egypt, that they are waymarks, but of a different line of waymarks. Because if Pydna is the end of the Antigonid kings, then the battle that takes place at Thermopylae would be the midnight of the situation with the Antigona kings. Okay. Um, Now, is that logical? Well, yeah, but I'm asking the question, though, why why do we know these dates? First, ask that question. We're placing, we're making use of these dates to establish when different nations were coming onto the world stage. Okay, I know, but I, I, I'm asking a more basic uh, astronomical question. Okay. How do we know these dates? So why do we know the date June 22nd? We don't know the date for Paneum, but we do know for Raphia and Pydna. The question is why? So what happens on these dates is there is a lunar eclipse. Ah. So that helps us recognize those dates. Now, with Rafi, it's going to happen the day after. With Pidna, it happens the night of, right? So it's, but we we can mark those dates. Now, so in 2017, June 22nd, on the Macedonian calendar, the Babylonian calendar, it's going to be the 12th day of the third month, right? Uh, Shavan, uh, Savan, right? Uh, Shamanu in Babylonian. And and then when you get to uh, 168, you're going to have um, now technically on the biblical calendar, it's going to be the 13th day of the third month, and then it says here it's going to be the 14th day. But I'm I'm counting the night before, so um, so it's it's kind of a bit tricky here. And they're going to have it on the 14th day. So it's going to be the eighth year of Antiochus, the fourth Epiphanes, that you're going to have that Battle of Pinna. It's on, in that year and his um, calendar, right? In the Babylonian calendar, it's the year 144 of Macedon. Um, but 168 BC. So so the thing is, we have these eclipses that, that mark these things. And I have there the 12th day of the third month. That's probably... A little bit fudging to make them both those dates. Depends which calendars you're looking at. Um, but this is this is um, this ties these together. And the main point that I'm trying to say here is that we have these things that echo each other, but they're 49 years apart. So what would be the significance then of the 49?
Well, it's a jubilee year. Okay, so it's a symbol of a jubilee, right? So how is that significant then in our understanding of this? What is that? What is that telling us as a symbol? Is it not uh, also having a probation of time? Okay, I didn't catch what you said. Having what? Uh, probation of time. Close of, uh, we find that uh, there's a 770 here, here, here. time. Yes, because we know that the 217 years, when you divide the 62 weeks into 31 weeks and 31 weeks, the 31 weeks is 217 years. And then we have this symbol of 217 BC, which represents that. It's tied to the 70 weeks prophecy. Right. And then we can see here a jubilee cycle that also ties us to the 70 weeks prophecy. Does that help clarify things a bit? OK. So so one of the things that we are often are forgetting when we're looking at Bible prophecy in our lives is that these prophecies that we are experiencing are an echo of the prophecies of the past. That is their, their typifications. Right. These prophecies of the past typify our history. And so God has given us these things as symbols, as objective symbols that we can look at and analyze what we're experiencing. Now we can see that there's a battle of Raphia and there's a battle of Pidna and that they contain the same symbols. In between that is the battle of Paneum. The battle of Paneum is going to be, you know, 17 years after the battle of Raphia, you know, so that's going to put this divided into 17 and 32 years. Not sure what that means, but it it shows that these are part of a structure, that, that there's a repeat of history that's happening. And in our history, we can see that we have these raffias, you know, November 9th, 2019, January 6th, 2021. But these are, are echoes of something that's going to happen, that there is this progression unfolding of prophecy and that we need to recognize that we're in an unfolding of light, an unfolding of prophecy and that we can't ignore the things that God has showed us that have to occur before Jesus comes back. Like one thing we know is Jesus is not coming back this year, right? Right. Right. You know, a lot, a lot of people just say, well, maybe Jesus is going to come this year. A lot of Christians are like that. We know Jesus isn't coming back this year because there is events that have to occur. And, and you couldn't have those events, no matter how rapid end time events are. You couldn't have them happen in two months. Right. There's a lot of things that have to ha happen. So. So those things are going to happen. And they're going to happen rapidly. But they're going to happen in order. Those events are going to unfold in order. And we know we're approaching, approaching midnight. So we're approaching the Battle of Raffi. But just because we've had Raffi in our lines doesn't mean that we ignore um, those other Raffias and say, well, they weren't correct. Or it doesn't mean that we um, uh, you know, say, well, all that really matters is the real Raffia. All of them matter. God is unfolding these things. These parallels all matter. Now, on, on the right side there, I have an 88 years period between the Jesuit order forming in July 21st, 1773, and the Battle of Manassas in July 21st, 1861. Now, that's that's another study, but I, I was just examining that as, as something, right? It's kind of an unfinished study. But that symbol of midnight, you can see, is attached here to Raphia, right, with 217 BC. But it also ties it in with this June 22nd date. And so this June 22nd and this July 21st and July 18th, all of these dates are tied together in prophetic symbols. So when we 
we start to look at this because we're going to go through this and and try to understand this better. Um, Daniel 11 is the Battle of Raphia, and we're gonna we're gonna try to apply this and what this means to our movement. Yeah. So uh, Samuel says uh, in the chat there. Um, uh, our God takes care of history and that history and prophecy agree. That's why his coming just can't be abrupt. Yes. So we know that we go through this, this process. Now the Millerites did try to skip that step, right? They just tried to say, well, all these things we expected to happen before Jesus come, we're just going to set them aside. Jesus is coming October 22, 1844. Um, and, and we sort of did that with July 18. Right, so you can see the parallel there. Um, now, one of the things that we're going to see when we just just as an overview of these verses, so we're going to look at all the symbols that we have in these verses, numbers, uh, meanings of names, other comparisons and parallels to other things in Scripture. We're going to look at all of those symbols. Um, but just to kind of go as an overview, so we see the Battle of Raphi, and then afterward. When he hath taken away the multitude, his heart shall be lifted up, and he shall cast down many ten thousands, but he shall not be strengthened by it. Now, we know this number of ten thousand is a symbol. We had it in the story um, in the book of Judges, in, in a couple of the stories. And uh, one of the places we looked at was this verse to see what ten thousands is about. Now, um, so we have this word 10,000s. So we're going to look at that symbol. It's a numerical symbol. It has something to do with prophecy. Uh, for the king of the north shall return and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former and shall certainly come after certain years with great army, with a great army and with much riches. So whatever the king of the south is going to do, which we're calling the Battle of Raphia, uh, we know that there's going to be per persecution attached to it. That's the casting down of many ten thousands. But it's going to cause the weakening of the king of the south. So this is a dire crisis worldwide. That even though we have symbols attached to it, we have to take this in a much more literal sense. Right? And then it says, for the king of the north shall return and shall set forth a multitude greater than the former, and shall certainly come after certain years. So we have... Um, some symbols there, certain years, 6256 and 8141. So we're going to have to look at those symbols. Now, this word certain, um, uh, we had in, I'm just going to see if I can find it here. We had in Dan, it was the word time in Daniel 11. It was mentioned earlier in verse 6, right? So we had looked at that as a symbol. And um, so one of the things about that word, certain, do you remember what the, the symbol had to do with? So if we took, um, so it's a that certain. Do with Paul Monon, a certain saint, Daniel 8, 13. Is it the same word for certain? I mean, the same nope. Hebrew word? Oh, it's not. Okay. No. Remember, it's the number, if you add, if you multiply 6 times 2 times 5 times 6, you get 360. Prophetic year. Okay. That's why I asked you, because you're the one who brought that up. Right? It's called time. For uh, That's going to be in verse 6 in these times, right? 6, 2, 5, 6. So it's going to be the same word. Um so, so it says after certain years. Well, this word uh, time, especially now or when. So it really be like after uh, now years, right? I mean, if you're going to translate it literally. So, um, and and then years, of course, is shana, right? That's just, and we've had that symbol in our line already. So we'd have to look at that. How does that relate? Um, so this is, of course, the Battle of Paneum. And in those times, and again, you're going to have this word 
certain, which is now just translated as times in the King James, and, right? Um, and it's going to have instead of, uh, you know, so it's not going to have years here. It's just going to have those times and uh, uh, their times. There shall many stand up against the king of the south. Also, the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fail. So, so can we connect um, here, you know, what we were talking about 191, uh, is that when, when do we have the robbers of thy people exalt themselves to establish the vision? What date have we generally attached to that? Well, that's, I think, understood to have taken place just before Panium. So yeah, so I, I think, think it's going to be two around 200. Yeah, so uh, the Syrian Macedonians soon found a change coming over the aspect of their dream. The Romans interfered on behalf of the young king of Egypt, determined he should be protected from the room devised by Antiochus and Philip. This was 200 BC and one of the first important references of the Romans in the affairs of Syria and Egypt. Okay, so they're going to place it as, and then we're going to have a quote from Rollins. Um, uh, so Roland is going to have a quote there. So we're saying they exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they fall. They shall fall. Now, now it says in these in those times, so it's just, the way that they're translating this, the way they're interpreting this, in this time of the Battle of Panea, in those times, the robbers of that people are going to exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they fall, right? So the king of the north shall come and cast up a mount and take the most fenced cities, and the arms of the south shall not withstand neither his chosen people, neither shall there be any strength to withstand. So, so this is going to basically remove Egypt, I mean, it's, it's still there, but, but what is the significance of Panium? Uh, how does this, this battle of Panium, how does it relate as far as what happens to, to, to the Telemic Empire? Uh, just reading here. Well, you still have the Polemic aspect of Greece still going on. Yeah. In, uh, yeah. 31. Uh, yeah, BC, I know. Active. Right. right. So, so what happens, but how do we look at this prophetically as far as the king of the south? What is, what is it that happens to the king of the south? What is, what does this battle mean? Why is it important? You know, and, and we know that, uh, Uri Smith doesn't actually mention Panea in this context, right? For some reason, I don't know why he doesn't mention the Battle of Panea. But he only mentions Raffi, he doesn't mention Panea. But other people have recognized this as Panea. So what does this have to do? What part does this play? Is this the last time that uh, the polemic empire has anything to do with the, the territory around the uh, Jerusalem and Israel. Right. So it pushes it out of the Levant. Right? Yes. Okay. Um, now it's going to end up switching. Uh, so we're not we're we're gonna come back to this tomorrow, but uh, we know that that this is gonna be Basically, the transition is going to happen between Greece and Rome, right? So this is going to progress. Um, so we're going to start to be able to see Rome in this history. So Rome is, is eventually going to conquer uh, the northern kingdom. So it becomes the king of the north, right? 
So, so that's what's going to happen. So we'll look at this tomorrow. We'll start delving into this a little bit deeper. But I just wanted to go over that basic idea of what it is we're doing here. So we're looking at something that's historically has occurred, but is typifying something that has not yet happened but is echoed by other histories, that we can look at our history and see an echo of it. We can look at what happened when we look at Rafi as being November 9th, 2019, right? We haven't really understood what the, the paneum is in that history, but we have looked at uh, Rafi being a January 6th, 2021. But again, we're looking for a paneum that's still future, that is uh, the Republicans conquering the Democrats. And, and maybe these uh, raffias just show up without the resolution happening till later. I don't know. But, but you know, we're going to look at that, how we would apply it to our time. But more importantly, I think that this is talking about future events. In our, in when we look at this history, it's primarily typifying events that we have not yet entered into. Okay. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? I know this is a little bit scattered today, but. That's what we have. We should make it clear as we go on. Okay, let's pray. <clears throat> A dear father in heaven, thank you for the study and for the participation that we have had here this morning. We know that we have a lot of study ahead of us, but we are thankful that we are in this time, that you are teaching us, that you are using us to your glory. Help me to remember the 2,111 number where I got it from, and to see the numbers that are in these verses, and how, what information they give us. Help us in, in our personal study. May your angels watch over each one. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.